Now we'll move to the next. What are the modes of battery thermal management? So we'll define every mode here, and then we'll move further. So modes. What are two? Mo Basically, there are two modes. One is active, another one is passive. Active is as soon as there is a change in temperature. So there is a means available there. There is equipments available there. There is there is a process available there that will try to take out that heat and throw away to the ambient. That is what is active. Passive is you don't spend and this active require energy. Immediately it requires energy. In passive, you don't require immediate energy to take out the heat or bring back the heat. That's the basically main difference between active and passive. However, to charge or discharge the passive uh, thermal management, you need energy, but that could be outside whenever it is cheap or you can utilize the environmental factor. All those things is possible with the passive. Now, in active, in active thermal management, what other things comes? The air cooling system. One of them is air cooling system. So, now since I have to maintain the temperature between 25 to 35, if my ambient condition is 45, how air will cool the my battery? If I simply take air from the ambient and throw inside the battery pack, basically it will increase the temperature instead of decreasing the temperature. Am I right? So what we have to do, we have to cool the air. We have to cool the air to a defined limit so that it can cool the battery or it, can, it, it should be able to take the heat generated by the battery pack. How can we cool the air? Because now outside temperature is 45. Can we put some ice sheet or can we put something known as refrigeration system there? But to run the refrigeration system, you need the energy. From where that energy will come? That energy will come from the same battery pack. So, with the <coughs> refrigeration unit, you cool the air and that air you said and the heat is rejected to the ambient, you send that air to the battery pack and it is cooled. Now, it is your wish you want to throw that air simply outside or you want to recirculate. So, when you are recirculating that air, that means again you are cooling, that means whatever heat has it has absorbed in the battery pack that you are taking from that air, throwing it outside and then again cool air you are sending to battery pack. What would be the case if the temperature is 10 degree or 0 degree or minus 10 degree? What you have to do at that time? You have to basically heat the air for heating what you require. Again, you require energy from the battery. Correct. Now you are heating, now heated air is going inside, it is heating up the battery pack to your level 15 to 35 or whatever desired temperature is required and then now when air is heating the battery pack, it is getting cooled. Now it is coming back to your active system, it is get heated up and then again it gets recirculated. So what you are doing? you are taking the cold energy and you are throwing outside in the cold environment. So this is how the air cooling system works. Now there is another is liquid cooling system. Liquid cooling system could be water, water glycol mixture or some other material. So again you have to cool in the similar way what we have done for air, however the volume required for the liquid is much, much lower than liquid flow is much, much lower than what would have been for air flow. So let us suppose if my battery pack is small or my C rate is very small 0.2 C, 0.3 C, 0.4 C, 0.5 C something like that. I may prefer to go for air cooling because in liquid cooling I will have another one more system there 
like a chiller or a water heater other than my refrigeration system. However, when C rate is very high, 1C or 1.5C or 2C, it is a preferable mode of thermal management system. Again, let us go back to the last slide what we have discussed <coughs> thermal resistance or heat transfer. Heat transfer depends upon whenever I am talking air and liquid, it is basically convective heat transfer. So, what is the delta one term is delta T? The cross sectional area remains same or surface area you say it is a surface area through which it is flowing. H heat transfer coefficient, convective heat transfer coefficient. For air, when you are doing force cooling, the heat transfer coefficient is between something like 20 watt per meter per Kelvin to 100 watt per meter square per Kelvin. For liquid, if, if I am using water or water glycol, it can go to 300, 500, 700 and that is how the volume be required becomes very less. However, air is available in the uh, environment, liquid either water or water glycol or any such liquid is not easily available. You cannot tap it. So, you have to store it on the vehicle or in a battery pack. So, that will add weight, but however, a small weight compared if I have to if air would also not have been available in the environment, then I would have taken if I would have compressed and kept it the weight would have been much more than the liquid in the liquid cooling system. This liquid could be anything only the primary requirement of this liquid is it should not corrode, it should have high heat transfer, it should be cheap available not poisonous similar way for air. Now, there is a third <coughs> there is a third option I will not take liquid. I will not take air. Can we cool it directly through refrigerant? Yes, we can do. If you have further energy requirement in the sense higher C rate 2, 2.5 C, 3 C, I want quickly heat to be removed. What a refrigeration direct expansion refrigeration system does? it is get it changes its phase. Because of change of phase the high amount of heat can be extracted. So, here we are using phase change active phase change and we are also eliminating one another subsystem in either air cooling system we wanted to have something like blower which we are eliminating. In liquid cooling system we need to have a chiller and a pump that we are eliminating. However, since this is phase change it converts from liquid to gas, gas to liquid there is all and it is a pressurized system the pressure can go for 20 bar, 30 bar, 35 bar. So, there is always a chance of leakage if we can maintain that leakage that there is no leakage this is one of the base system. Ideally, the fourth one hybrid system what we are talking about is used everywhere. It is a combination of direct expansion or liquid system, combination of refrigerant or air system or combination of all the threes because it is not only battery. It is a, there is a power electronics then there is a motor all those things need to be cooled. So, it is a combination of these it is used in hybrid system and it is the most commonly used. Uh, active thermal management system. Now, passive. Passive we use again phase change material. Phase change in material is what? We are also using here phase change material. The refrigerant is nothing but it is a phase change material, but the density energy density is very very high. 
However, in the simple phase change material, we may not have that much high energy density. However, it is still better than, in many of the cases, it may be better than cooling with the ambient air. How does it work? It has a certain melting point or range of melting point, very small range, like 35 degree. So that means it will start melting from 32 to 36 degree. And at that time, because of the melting, it can take high amount of heat. Only problem with this is, one is leakage. It can also leak because now it is changing between solid to liquid. Here it was liquid to gas. It's a similar way here, uh, it's a solid to liquid. One problem is expansion. When phase change happens, it expands. So that creates extra pressure on the packing. Because of that, it's uh, leakage can happen. That's one. The second thing is the thermal conductivities are very low. To enhance the thermal conductivity, we try to fit in metal box or uh, <coughs> some metallic porous media things, and then we pour the PCM there. Third thing is the melting temperature. I cannot use a melting temperature of 25 degrees C, which would have been based at the temperature of 45 ambient, because it will take heat from outside, get melted, and lose its function. However, if ambient is 45 and we use a, a PCM of 45 degrees C, it will still help the temperature not go beyond 45 degrees. And every reduction in temperature towards the 15 to 35 degrees C helps in improving the life. The another thing is embedded micro channels in the micro channels like heat pipes. It does not consume the energy actively. However, it is still able to transfer the heat from inside to outside. Sometime it can maintain the lower temperature also by evaporative cooling inside the battery box. Okay? So this is basically various modes of thermal management defined into two active and thermal, uh, sorry, active and passive. And in that active, we have air cooling system, liquid air, uh, air type thermal management system, liquid type thermal management system, direct expansion or refrigerant, and then hybrid. And in passive, mostly it's a PCM and embedded micro channels. Now I'll show you uh, example of active thermal management system. The first one is force air convection. You see, you have a refrigeration unit, then you have uh, you have a refrigeration unit, then you have a blower, and that air is sent over battery pack. Now, you can further increase the heat transfer by extending the fin surfaces, increasing the heat flux, and we use this heat flux up to 0 0.5 watt per cm square. Heat flux is nothing but Q by A. Heat transfer, you multiply, uh, sorry, divide by surface area, that becomes heat flux. Liquid cooling of battery packs, it enables a high heat rejection compared to air cooling. Heat flux can go up to 0.5 watt per centimeter square to 2 watt per centimeter square. The immersion cooling. Immersion cooling is nothing but we dip the whole battery pack, uh, battery pack in, uh, in a reservoir, in a liquid reservoir. The benefit of this is you have a very nice temperature uniformity. Whatever heat is coming, it is taken by the fluid it, or liquid, which can penetrate even a smallest area available. However, again we have to cool this liquid outside somewhere. This is very popular in high energy or uh, uh, high performing chips, microprocessor. Because the heat flux is very high there and can be taken only by this method. 
no other methods works out properly. So, this can again be used in our case also, however, my C rate should be very high 5 C, 8 C, 10 C, but this is the addition of weight so that also we have to be careful. Liquid could be anything, depends upon your temperature, what temperature you wanted to maintain. If you want to maintain, let us suppose, uh, minus 10 degree. So, in that case, you would go for refrigerant like R134, 4A, something like that. If you want to maintain 35 degree or 40 degree, so there are artificial material, artificial liquids which will start boiling at 35 degree. So that means it is taking heat. Now, if you have a option of 100 to go 100 degree C, the best material would be water, depending upon the temperature range. Like for electronics, 70, 75 degree, 80 degree C is good enough. So, a material which can boil at 70 degree, 80 degree C is being used. And the material will be huh. Then that material you have to pump outside, cool it and again resend back or you can also wait that my functionality is only for 30 minutes. So, I am having that much of liquid, 30 minutes all the liquid will start boiling means that much energy and then after that it would be uh, not used for next 4 hours. So, you put extended fin so it will slowly cool down. The next one is Peltier cooling where we are cooling one thing by another effect known as Peltier effect. Peltier effect when you flow the current, one surface would become heated, another surface will become cold. So, if you are if you if you are cooling it, then the cold surface should be attached to the surface where you are cooling. The benefit of this is you just reverse the polarity at lower temperature, it will start heating up that surface. So, it can work in both way. However, the performance of Peltier instruments, efficiency I say is very, very low. In heating mode, it gives efficiency, we say coefficient of performance more than one. However, in cooling mode, as soon as your delta T increases. more than 5 degree, 7 degree, the performance come down to 0.2 COP, coefficient of performance come down to 0 0.2, 0 0.3 like that. <coughs> so, how to determine which thermal management system we should use? So, there is a nice example here, again the same pack we have used. 2 p 16 s which we have developed. So, consider the 2 p 16 s pack with shown dimensions and utilizing the result from the previous example. The example which we have just talked about what was what is the thermal impedance or thermal resistance and then what would be the heat loss or heat generated. Identify a suitable thermal management system to maintain the pack temperature at 45 degree C. So, I wanted to maintain the pack temperature at 45 degree C while in an ambient of 35 degree C. My ambient is 35 degree C. Assume the convective area is 0 0.168 meter square. So, what we have seen in the last example the heat generation rate of the pack is 72 watt, means 72 joule per second. Thermal resistance is nothing but delta T by Q, actually Q equal to delta T by R. So, what we have put here, R is delta T by Q. So, T cell 45 degree, T ambient is 35, heat generated Q is 72 watt, delta T, T cell minus T ambient is 10 degree C. So, thermal resistance if you calculate it becomes 0 0.13 Kelvin per watt, sorry K per watt. 
now your temperature is 45 degree ambient is 35 now you have a resistance in between that the convective resistance is nothing but 1 by ha the thermal resistance is this one convective area is 0.168 convective heat transfer coefficient what is required is 0.0045 watt per centimeter square kelvin now there is a nice plot here once you have found out what is the heat transfer coefficient you require it's a convective heat transfer coefficient then you can think of what mode of thermal management system you want to go it's a logarithmic scale here at the bottom the heat transfer coefficient convective heat transfer coefficient it can be utilized for other conductive as well as radiative also point 0.00012 thousand watt per centimeter square per kelvin what we have got here 0.0045 where it comes it comes something here so either we can go for natural that means we just provide sufficient channels the air to be flow so that would be natural convection it can dissipate the heat outside or generally packs are sealed properly i'll come back why we pack uh, we seal the packs so in that case if i provide the air channels i have to force the air or if you keep it open completely in an environment of 35 degree it can dissipate so that's why what we are saying is that the force convection would be more suitable here so in that we can maintain the ceiling also as well as the heat transfer coefficient also considering the whole pack this graph would change slightly application to application this is just like a thumb rule or a basic point where we to, where to start the simplest way of where to start what should we require this comes something here what is that this all three together single phase force convection in this case of air it can go fluorochemicals like what we are using generally in immersion cooling the fluorochemical can have a boiling point at different but heat transfer is generally low water or water glycol mixture so if you see this plot what we see here this comes here in this range now you go up this touches this for air and what is this force convection the similar network can be modeled for heat transfer through the cell cell holder insulation what we have considered here is only the pack we are not considered anything else there are other things like you have seen what we have what we have done during the mechanical design we provide the cell holder or end plates or side strips these all are resistance all are converted into resistance and then you consider that would be either in series or parallel depending upon the path and then you select a suitable method methodology it should be natural convection or force convection or in force convection it is air force convection as a, uh, using the medium air or using the medium water or using the medium water glycol okay any question this this graph is very important graph this is experimental graph experimental correlated graph so this gives us a a very nice tool to determine what type of thermal management system i should go 
without doing much calculations. Okay, let us move to next slide. How to make thermal uh, networks exactly? This is one number I have provided here. This is this is like a range here I have provided here. So, you have got 0 0.0045. Correct. So, it is it is from here if you see here this is coming from 0 0.001 up to 0 0.01. There I have put a particular here it is range. It can go to that range. So, now one assignment problem for thermal network. A MOSFET plus heat sink arrangement with the below specification is arranged at shown. Find the MOSFET junction temperature using the thermal network approach. What are the things is there? MOSFET is there, then there would be a generally a thermal pad and then there would be heat sink and then there is a convection to the outside ambient condition. So, there is one resistance thermal resistance because of the MOSFET internal structure itself. Another thermal resistance will come because of the thermal pad, one more resistance will come because of the heat sink and the at the end the convective resistance. All the parameter for MOSFET is given here, thickness area thermal conductivity is also given here for thermal pad for heat sink. Convective heat transfer is also given here. So, please find out MOSFET junction temperature. Junction temperature is this red, this red here that is junction temperature. Okay. The another assignment that was on electronics part of the battery pack. Now, we have done 2 p 16 as one example problem. Now, the pack is present at 45 degree C, consider 2 C discharge. What we have considered there is 1 C discharge. Now, let us consider 2 C discharge and identify suitable thermal management method out of this. So, natural single phase force or boiling with water fluorochemical or water fluorochemical air. What is the constraint? The limit the cell temperature to 50 degree C. We do not want the cell temperature to go beyond 50 degree C. Assume that heat is extracted only using the bottom surface, only the bottom surface of the pack. You have all the information for this pack in the last example problem itself we have done. Voltage, capacity, internal resistance, we have already given you dimensions also here. Let us find out what is the suitable thermal management method is for this particular pack. If we have to maintain the temperature at 50 degree C in an ambient condition of 45. Passive thermal management system we are talking about. We have already talked about active thermal management system. The passive thermal management system, you do not invest energy at that moment. Most of the time it can be done naturally or like in the case of phase change material, you take it, cool it and then come back. So, at that place you put energy charge and discharge cycle, but not you are not taking the energy from the battery. The simplest example is the heat sink. Especially in electronic components, mostly you we, we use this passive thermal management system using the heat sink. What we do here, we try to increase the surface area of heat transfer. How can you increase the heat transfer? Q is what? H A delta T. Either you can increase H, you can increase A or you can increase delta T to increase Q or you can do all three. So, what we are doing here, we are increasing the surface area of heat transfer. 
we are increasing A. Yeah. However, up to 0 0.5 watt per centimeter square, that is the maximum we can go with this. Easiest and cheapest to implement and maintain. The same thing we can also do in the battery pack over the cell. You will see a lot of battery pack with the fins. exposed to the ambient. However, the C rate of those packs would be generally limited to very low. Heat pipes. In enclosed environment, when my environment is enclosed, I may not be able to use the heat sink, because it need to be exposed to the outside environment. Is there a way where I can take heat and put it into, into the open environment? So, heat pipe is one of the example. It takes heat from inside and throw it outside. Again, it could be forced cooling as well as natural cooling. When it is natural cooling, it is generally comes into the passive thermal management system. Area of the MOSFET generally we consider there not the heat sink, because by heat sink we try to increase the uh, surface area. So, there was a question here that 0 0.05 watt per centimeter square heat flux is of MOSFET or is of heat sink. So, generally the area we consider is for MOSFET here, where we need to remove the heat. So, we have talked about heat pipe cooling, how do we do? So, we take, we transfer the heat, there is a mechanism, there is a part at, there is a some liquid field at the partial pressure, partial vapor pressure. So, it takes the heat, get converted into gaseous phase, cool down at ambient and then again that fluid keeps on circulating. So, that is how heat pipe functions, generally made of very good conductor, generally copper made. generally water, but at partial pressure, partial vapor pressure. So, boiling points come down, comes down. For one atmospheric pressure, the, the, the boiling point of water is around 100 degree centigrade. However, if you reduce the pressure, vapor pressure or, par, or partial pressure we say, vapor pressure we generally say, if you reduce, that means you reduce the ambient pressure, like at hill station your water will boil at lower temperature 95 degree or 90 degree. If you further reduce, it may boil at 70 degree centigrade. So, that concept is used here. So, you partially vacuum the pipe, then fill with some small amount of water. Now, it can boil at the lower temperature. So, it can convert into vapor and that travel down, there is a path there to outside ambient, it releases the heat there, convert back to the liquid and. And how do we ensure it only goes in that direction? No, it is a just uh, what do you say capillaries action, very small capillaries type of tube it would be. You have to be little bit loud. The pipe, uh, the which material of heat pipe is made of? That is a question. Generally, it is made of copper, generally, because it needs high thermal conductivity also, then only it can release the heat to outside and can also circulate the heat in, into the pipe. So, the thermal conductivity of 10 to 100 times of the copper, even though copper is, we, we, we measure the efficiency in terms of how much thermal conductivity has increased because of this. So, it is made of copper, but because the phenomenon of moving the fluid inside and changing the phase, the effective thermal conductivity of the copper, if you consider only the copper and then some other material, you can consider the other, other material thermal conductivity has gone up to 100 times by this phenomenon. And what will happen? If thermal conductivity is increases, what will happen? The heat transfer rate will 
increase q is nothing but k a delta t so effectively effectively we are increasing k by a mechanism inside okay now third one is by decreasing the contact resistance by filling with a some better thermal conductive materials so we use thermal paste even between the cells we use thermal paste to increase the heat transfer next one is phase change materials which we discussed earlier also how does it do it changes its phase because of phase change the high amount of energy can be absorbed and can be released both whatever you require if you want to absorb the energy then it will change the phase from either solid to liquid or liquid to gas if you are absorbing if you are releasing the heat then reverse will happen from gas it will convert into liquid and from liquid it will convert into solid temperature remain constant at that time like boiling solidification so maintaining the same temperature you can still take out the large amount of heat or you can put back large amount of heat heat by utilizing the phenomenon of phase change and we say also it say it latent heat there is something known as sensible heat sensible heat happens because of the temperature change and latent heat is same temperature but because of the phase change okay wide operation operational temperature minus 30 to 150 degrees c quite efficient if you use it judiciously considering the environmental factor the pcm becomes one of the best thermal management system for battery because you don't utilize the energy of the battery 